Hi, I'm Pastor Steve Feinstein, and this is the next video in my series on a healthy church and healthy church members. And so last time I reviewed the book written by Mark Dever, What is a Healthy Church? And so this time we're going to go over the companion piece to it written by Tabidi Anabwile, uh, which is titled, What is a Healthy Church Member? And indeed, these two books are meant to be read together. And if you do read them together, that they're such a blessing. So in the last video, I talked about what a healthy church is, what a biblical church is. And we went over specifically nine marks or nine characteristics of a healthy church or a biblical church. So if you have not watched that video, I think you need to watch that one before you watch this one. And the reason I say that is everything in this book is built entirely off of the other book. So for example, there's nine marks of a healthy church. This one then is gonna show you that there are equivalent marks for a healthy church member. Okay, so each of the nine marks of a healthy church translates into a healthy mark for a church member. And so that's why very important to watch the last video. That way uh, you'll understand more so what I'm talking about in this video. Okay, so with that being said, getting started right away, uh, let me remind us that, you know, being a, a member of, of Christ, being united with Christ, this is not a private matter. You were born again into a family. In America, we tend to act like uh, our, our Christian faith is a private matter. It's between us and God, but that's not true. You were born again into a new covenant community, into the church, into uh, God's people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. That being said, if, <clears throat> if we're going to be healthy Christians, we're going to belong to healthy churches, and if we're going to uh, belong to healthy churches, those churches require healthy members. And so what that means is for a church to be biblical and healthy, it depends just as much on you as it does on the leaders. Okay, It's not something where the leaders make the church healthy. No, it's all the members together make the church healthy. Well, you can't have a healthy church if you don't have healthy church members. And pretty much those nine marks of a healthy church will be mirrored uh, within the lives of, of each member if you're going to have a healthy church. <clears throat> and so the, the question is, what are you going to do? Okay, what are you going to do about the state of the church? So easy for people to go up to a pastor and complain, well, I don't like this about our church, or we don't evangelize enough, or it doesn't seem that people are getting together enough. Well, what are you going to do about it, right? Pretty much complaining about something and then going to somebody else expecting them to take care of it is not a loving thing to do, okay? A healthy church member it's going to say, what can I do to make this church healthy? If they see a problem and they're the ones who noticed it, then perhaps the Holy Spirit is telling them they are the ones who uh, need to be the solution instead of just complaining or complaining or crying about it. Okay, so that's just have that in the back of your mind. What are you going to do to make the church what it's supposed to be? Because really, at the end of the day, it's it's up to you. It's up to me. It's up to all of us together. Okay, so that being said, last time we saw that there were nine marks of a healthy church. Now we're going to go over 10 marks of a healthy church member. And obviously the first nine um, are parallel to the nine uh, marks of, of a healthy church. So if you remember, the first mark of a healthy church was uh, expositional preaching, right? Expositional preaching. So the corollary to that, if you're going to be a healthy church member, is that you're going to have the characteristic of expository listening. So if the church is supposed to do expository preaching, you should be doing expository listening. Okay, now last time I defined expository preaching. It's where the, the, the sermon, the point of the text... Okay, is the point of the sermon. You have a biblical text. The text sets the agenda of the sermon. Pretty much the sermon explains the text and applies the text. It doesn't use the text to springboard into a different subject. It doesn't uh, use the text in, in, in any way like a, of a topical sermon. No, an expositional pre, a sermon takes a text 
and as I said, dives into the text, explains the text in its context, and then principalizes it in our current context so we know how it applies in our lives, right? So if that's how the preaching's supposed to be, the question then is, what's the responsibility of the church member? Okay, the preacher has to come up with the expository sermons, but you have to have a heart for expository listening. You have to want to hear these kind of sermons. To be an expository listener means you are coming to the text saying, I want to hear God. Because if a text is preached in an expositional way, you are hearing God. Because it's the text that's being explained rather than the musings of the preacher. And so that should be your your greatest craving. I want to hear God. I, I came here to hear God, right? So you're listening for what does the text mean? You want to know what it means. You want to know the historical background. You want to know everything that you need to know to be able to understand that text. That way it doesn't go over your head anymore. That way uh, you don't misapply it. God put that text there for you, for your growth, and a healthy church member wants it. They want what God put there. Every single verse of the Bible, they want, and they want to understand it rightly, and they want to apply it rightly. So, if you're going to be an expository listener or expositional listener, then you're going to let the text set the agenda for what you learn. Instead of you showing up saying, well, I want to know about this, or I want to know about that. No, God is going to tell you what you need to learn based on the text being preached. So you're letting the text, you're letting the Bible set the the agenda. Okay? And, and again, when you're an expository listener, you're listening for meaning. You're not showing up to hear something that, that's clever or relevant or that meets your felt needs. No, you just want to know, okay, we're preaching this text. I want to know what it means. So you're listening for meaning. And as you listen to a lot of exp- expositional sermons and you start to see how they're done, you actually start to learn how to read the text yourself, to read it for what it means rather than what you want it to mean or whatever self-centered reason people go to the text. No, you're going to the text because you know that is where God speaks. Okay, so so you have this heart and this mindset to listen. Now, the, the benefit of this is you will have sound doctrine. You will also understand how to read and apply and interpret the text. You will grow. And not only that, when, when, an expo- when an expositional preacher has a congregation of people who expositionally listen, that encourages the preacher. Okay, when, when a preacher is doing what's right, but the congregation rebels, they're like, no, we want you to preach topical sermons. We want you to talk about this. That discourages the preacher, and that runs a lot of preachers off, and then they they go to other churches. And and the scriptures actually say that their time will come in 2 Timothy 4, where people will not endure sound doctrine, and what are they going to do? They're going to gather for themselves teachers who tell them what they want to hear or tickle their ears, right? That's immaturity. If somebody's preaching to you the word, and you're mad, and collectively you rise up and demand that, that they preach towards your wants and your desires, you are the exact person that the Bible says is probably an unbeliever, okay? But if you're an expositional listener, then you want to know the meaning of the text, and that encourages the preacher, because they're doing all that work to give it to you, and then they're happy to know that you are happily receiving it, okay? So, If you want to learn better to be an expositional listener, uh, definitely meditate on the text. If your church actually puts out the text that's going to be preached on ahead of time, read that text throughout the week. A lot of times, outline it. Uh, Write down questions you have about it. And then, uh, then write down the answers to them once it gets preached. And if there's any questions that weren't answered, go to the preacher and ask. They, they're not going to get mad. Not if the preacher is expositional. He's going to be like, oh, I didn't answer that. And he'll be happy to answer that. So, first mark of a healthy member, be an expositional listener. Okay, make sure that, that your heart and soul is all about the Word of God. Now, the second mark, if you remember, of a church is biblical theology. So the corollary for a member is you will be a biblical theologian. Okay, and, and, and so you have to just remember what biblical theology meant in uh, Mark Dever's book. It meant that the church's doctrines and theology are all derived from the Bible. Um, that's what our statement of faith will be built on and all that kind of stuff. Now, I also mentioned that biblical theology 
is the the whole story or meta narrative of scripture that ties all 66 books together so you want to understand that you know it doesn't come easy it takes a lot of work but guess what if you are not a biblical theologian you are the type of person who will be tossed and turned by every wind of false doctrine because if you don't know what true doctrine is you're definitely not going to know what false doctrine is you'll be susceptible to it but if you understand how all 66 books go together how the covenants work and the epics and how the New Testament and Old Testament all work together, how there's promise, how there's fulfillment, and it's all one story that points ultimately to Christ, okay, then you are going to be less prone to be deceived. And you're going to want a quality preacher, a preacher who's who makes sure that their sermons are filled with biblical theology. You're going to go to a church where the statement of faith is filled with both biblical and systematic theology. And so, so the thing is, if you're going to be a healthy church member, you can't be lackadaisical in your biblical knowledge. Now look, if you don't know that much about the Bible now, maybe let's say you're a new believer, don't be discouraged. This is a lifetime project. And as long as you're reading the Bible daily and studying it and looking for the biblical theology and learning the doctrine and sitting under expositional preaching, you will grow. Okay. The problem is for those who for decade upon decade don't grow, they don't want to grow, they'll read their books about whatever their hobbies are but they can't get into the Bible, um, that person can never be a healthy church member. Even if they volunteer, that, that's great, but their heart is filled with the world rather than with Christ. They can't be a healthy church member. A healthy church member, if you cut them, they have to bleed the Bible. Okay, Now, that takes work, that takes effort, but it pays off. And when you are a biblical theologian, you start to think biblically. You start to think God's thoughts after him rather than the world's thoughts. Okay, So biblical theology helps you know God. It helps you know how the whole scripture uh, fits together. Um, you know, the lack of, or the ignorance of God is why the church is so weak in America. So the only way we fix that is by, by each member taking it upon themselves to be biblical theologians, to know the word. And if you do know the word, you're going to have more reverence for God. You're going to have the right ideas about a lot of things. You're going to understand that this is uh, one of our, our main purposes for being here is the Great Commission, because you understand the whole meta narrative of Scripture. You're gonna, and so you're going to support Great Commission efforts. And when you know the word, it protects you from heresy. Look, false teachers purposely go after those who don't know what the word says. And then what they do is they take verses out of context. That way you're actually reading it in the Bible and you're like, oh, it must be true. And then you get tricked. But that's because you don't understand theology. You don't understand uh, the context of the, where it fits into the whole scripture. If you want to protect yourself from these guys, the Bible calls them wolves for a reason. Okay, wolves in sheep's clothing, they're trying to trick you. Okay, if you want to guard yourselves from them, be at a church that practices expositional preaching, be yourself an exp expositional listener, and be a biblical theologian in a church that emphasizes biblical theology. Okay, And, and one thing I would suggest is, look, everybody in a, in a healthy church is going to sign that they understand and agree with the statement of faith. Make sure you really do understand your church's statement of faith and that you agree with it and that you could explain those doctrines. Okay, so if you remember the third mark of, of a healthy church was a biblical gospel. Okay, well, well likewise, a, a healthy church member is gospel saturated. You're a person who knows the gospel, loves the gospel, you're animated by the gospel, your whole church is animated by the gospel. Okay, it sustains and animates you in the church. You, you want to know the gospel, you desire to hear it. If the gospel's not present in a sermon, you feel like, uh, like, like, like you were robbed of something, right? Okay, because the gospel, it's the good news, right? The good news of what? That we are sinners, we deserve to be damned, God is holy, okay? And yet, because he is love, because God so loved the world, he sent a Savior, the God-man, Jesus Christ, to pay our penalty on the cross, to die in our place, though he was innocent, though he was without sin. And he did that so that our penalty would be paid. He could give us the credit of his righteousness, so that when the Father looks at us, we are sinless because he paid our debt, and we are righteous because he gave us the credit of his righteousness. He died for us. 
He rose on the third day. He's ascended at the right hand of the Father. So a sinner like me has now been reconciled to God. I've been drafted into his kingdom. I get to, to serve him as, a, as a, a royal priesthood. It's amazing, right? It really is the good news. Everybody's universally lost, but there is a way, a way to be reconciled to God, right? That should be the, the, the unifying factor of our lives. Is that, is that gospel, and that we are gospel-centered, gospel-saturated people. And when we think about the gospel, we think missionally. We start to think, okay, you know what? I'm going to go to the same grocery store, the same barber again and again. I'm going to start building relationships with the people who are there, same at restaurants or whatever. And then over the course of time, I'm going to find a way to start talking about gospel themes and then eventually to share the gospel with them because we know that they need this salvation just as much as we did. Crazy thing is a lot of people act like the gospel, uh, you know, it, it's been spreading for all of history from the time of Christ at least to now and then it gets to us and it's supposed to stop. No, no. The gospel was on the way to somebody else when it came to you. It came to you on the way to somebody else, meaning tag, you're it. Now you're supposed to be preaching the gospel. So the point is the gospel is what saves us. It's the good news. It's what creates the church. It's what, uh, you know, um, really just animates everything we do. So you need to know the gospel. You need to guard the gospel. And it just needs to be treated as that precious treasure. So Christian, if you're going to be a healthy church member, you have to be somebody that's all about the gospel. How, uh, how well do you know the gospel? How often do you think about it? Mark number four, if you remember, a biblical conversion okay, was the, the, the fourth mark of a healthy church. Well, that means you got to be a genuinely converted person. And just think about what that means, because we're so big on, on, unfortunately, easy believism and all that type of stuff. So, so we act like just because somebody raised their hand and said, oh, I believe what somebody told me about Jesus, we act like that's conversion. No, First uh, Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 says you turn away from your idols or your sin, and you turn to God in faith. So conversion, biblical conversion is a radical change where you accept the gospel, you receive it, but then you surrender your life to the Lord. You are not your own anymore. You believe by, by true, full faith and trust God that he has saved you and you turn away from your sin. You switch your allegiance from yourself to God. Okay, that is biblical conversion. So if you're going to be a healthy church member, you have to be a, a genuinely converted person. You know, it's interesting in, in, in uh, membership interviews, sometimes you'll find out that somebody's not really a Christian. They think they are. Um, and then when you get their testimony, it turns out like they never converted. They never turned from their sin. They never turned to God in faith. They never really understood what their dilemma was. They just uh, uh, felt like they needed something greater in their life. And so they accepted Jesus. That's not conversion, right? So you can't be a healthy church member if you're not an actual convert, somebody who's made that radical turn. And if you understand the gospel, you're going to understand conversion, right? And so then you will be a gospel-saturated, genuine convert, which leads to the fifth mark, which is biblical evangelism, right? A church is going to be an evangelistic church. Well, a healthy church member is a member that evangelizes. And again, this comes from the knowledge of the gospel and you're the fact that you're a real convert and you know what conversion entails. So then you're going to preach the gospel to people, not in pragmatism, not in easy believism, but you're going to tell them the honest truth that, look, you're a sinner. God is holy. Uh, you deserve to be damned, but thanks be to God that by the grace of God, he sent Jesus to die as our substitute, to raise on the third day. And, and if you believe on him, you'll be saved. But you got to surrender your life to him. You're not your own. <laughs> you know, so when you preach that to people, um, that's that's the only means by, by which they're going to be saved. So you're giving them the truth. Remember, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 5 says we are ambassadors of Christ. And we are to cry out to the world, be reconciled to God. Well, what does that mean? If we're if what we're appealing to them is to be reconciled, it means they're not reconciled. It means they're at enmity with God. It means they're damned. It means they're in a lot of trouble. And if we understand the gospel and we understand their need and we understand what conversion is and we understand where we fit in the story, where we are the ambassadors of the Great Commission and on behalf of God, he's actually speaking through us is what it says. It says the Holy Spirit makes his appeal through us. 
that they be reconciled to God. Then you're going to evangelize that way. You're going to look at everyone you know that doesn't know Jesus and your heart's going to break for, for their state. And so you're going to try to do something about it. Now, at the end of the day, conversion depends upon the Lord, but still you're going to be that faithful evangelist. Now, we need to abandon the language of decisionism. And what I mean by that is when you're trying to preach the gospel, don't say invite Jesus into your heart or receive Jesus through prayer because that's not how the Bible does it. Instead, you tell them, turn from your sin, repent, turn to Jesus in faith, give yourself to the Lord for the Lord laid down his life for you and took up his life again, right? That is that is biblical evangelism. Uh, in America, we've we've softened it because we don't want to offend people. But if you're not actually telling them what they're supposed to turn from, what they're supposed to turn to, and, and why they need to be saved in the first place, then you're you're doing them a great disservice. And that's why there's so many people who think they're Christians, and then you know a year later they they stop going to church. They don't think another thought about it. It's because they weren't uh, rightly evangelized. So we're, we're all supposed to do the work of evangelists. So a healthy church member listens to the Bible expositionally and to the sermons, and they crave that. Okay, They're biblical theologians that are always growing in the Word. They are people who are saturated with the gospel and love the gospel and expect the gospel to be central in their church. Okay, They're people who uh, are rightly and genuinely converted, and therefore there are people who want to evangelize to see other people rightly converted. Okay? Those are, are, those are five of the marks. Now, if you're not doing any of those, then, then you're not a healthy church member. But that's the beauty of a book like this and a video like this is so that we can, uh, if we're not healthy church members, we can become healthy church members because if we all do that, then our churches will become healthy churches. Now, mark number six is being a committed member because if you remember, the biblical mark was biblical membership. So that means you need to be a committed member. Okay, this is something that's missing today because people think their, their relationship with Jesus is entirely private. Uh, but you have to understand, membership is a biblical idea. And I defended that last time um, when I went over Mark Dever's book. So if you saw the last video, then, then you understand that. Okay, it's expected that we belong to a local church as a member that we are covenanted with a particular group of people under the leadership and authority of a particular group of leaders or pastors. Okay, and so so if you're going to be a committed member, not only do you do that, but you have to be more than just passive. You have to commit to this body of believers in love. You know, John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, Jesus said, this is how the world is going to know we're his disciples is how we love, right? If we just show up and we don't do anything and we're just like, hmm, sitting around, then we're not actually being committed members. We're, we're not showing love, okay? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says, stir one another up in good works and don't forsake the gathering of believers, Okay, then we're not supposed to do that. It's very, very important. So what does it look like then for you to be a committed member? Well, first you attend regularly. If you do not attend your church regularly, you are not a committed member. You're not a healthy member. You need to repent of that. And if you have no desire to go back, you might not even be saved. Now, if you have a desire, whatever's getting in the way, just repent of it. Your church needs you. It needs your gifts. And you're depriving people of an opportunity to love on you with the love that you need, right? We're supposed to love on you. And then at the same time, you're able to, to love on your church. Okay, uh, so it, it look, a healthy, uh, committed member attends regularly. They pursue peace within the church. They're not trying to start fights all the time. They edify each other. Just look up the word edify in the New Testament. We are commanded to build each other up in the word of God all the time. Okay, a committed church member, a healthy member will do that. They'll look towards other people and say, how can I help this person be more like Jesus? They warn each other. Okay, they reconcile with those who've sinned against them. Okay, that, that's non-negotiable. Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 doesn't even want your worship if you don't go reconcile with a brother that, that you've offended. Regularly to partake of the ordinances, the Lord's Supper, to observe baptisms, and to, to cheer on those who are being baptized. Uh, a committed member gives. Listen, I know in our country money is a private matter, but you are supposed to give financially to the work of the ministry. A healthy member will do that because they're committed to the work of that church. 
blows my mind that some Christians will come in and absorb that air conditioner. They'll, they'll sit there with their Bibles open with a smile on their face, uh, and, and they don't give a, a single cent to the work of the ministry in that church, and yet that pastor slaved 20 hours to put together that sermon for them. Everybody else there is loving on them. Everybody else is chipping in to pay for that air conditioner, to pay for people to clean up, to pay for that coffee that they, uh, you know, drank on the way in, you know, that the hospitality ministry put on. It's mind-blowing. Listen, all that, as important as it is, it, it takes funding, especially the preaching of the Word, and especially, you know, reaching out to the community through mercy ministry. That stuff isn't free. Okay, and so that's why the Bible again and again tells us to contribute to the work of the ministry. Okay, and that's what a, a committed member will do. And then uh, the Bible envisions in every member ministry. You often hear people say like 20% of the church members do 80% of the work and give 80% of the giving. That's just wrong. It should be 100% doing 100% of the work and doing the 100% of the giving. We've all been given gifts by the Holy Spirit and, you know, for the building up of the body. And we rob the church and we rob the Holy Spirit of that when we choose not to serve. So a healthy church member finds ministries that they are able to serve and help in. Okay, So that's a big one, a committed member. Mark number seven is discipline because the, the seventh mark of a healthy church is church discipline. We need to be a disciplined member. And I'm going to speed up because this is starting to go long. But a, a disciplined member is, is a person that understands that discipline is formative and corrective. What I mean by that is, is 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scriptures breathed out by God for teaching and, uh, and equipping in righteousness, and then for correcting and rebuking, right? So the first two things that are mentioned are formative, the teaching, okay? You're to be taught and you're to be equipped um, in righteousness. Those are things that the Word of God does to you. So if you're a disciplined person who's, you already have your biblical theology, you're an expository listener, you're saturated with the gospel, guess what's happening? The Word is constantly shaping the way you think. And it's disciplining your thinking. You're thinking God's thoughts after Him. And, and it's forming you and making you more like Jesus. That's actually part of discipline. And sometimes we do dumb things and we need to be corrected. And we humbly accept that. Because we know that Hebrews 12 says the Father only disciplines those He loves. So if somebody, if He raised up somebody in the church to love me enough to come and tell me I was wrong, instead of me getting mad, I should be like, wow, God, thank you for loving me. That that much. This just proves I'm your child because you only discipline your children, right? And so then it has that formative effect. The corrective side of discipline is where if the person refuses to repent, then Jesus gives us a process, a procedure. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20, one person goes to them. If they don't listen to that one person, then there's two more that come. And if they don't listen to the to the two, then it goes to the church. And if they don't listen to the church, and the church is appealing and begging them to repent, then Jesus says you, you expel them. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5 says the same thing, and there's, there's other passages that hit that well. A healthy church has people being disciplined in both ways. Okay, where we're, we're, it's formative, but it's corrective. And what you'll find is in the vast majority of cases, when you're having to use the corrective type of discipline, most of the time people repent and you have reconciliation and stronger Christians because of it. Occasionally you have the heartbreak of having to let somebody go, um, but the church is stronger because of it. And that's what the Bible promises us. So we just have to, you know, Christ is with us when we do this. So church, did, so you have to be committed to it. And it means you have to be one of the people who's willing to be the person who goes to somebody else alone, out of love to correct them. That's not the responsibility of just a few people. It's the responsibility of all members. And a healthy member will do that. Okay. Now mark number eight is being a growing disciple because the biblical mark number eight of a healthy church was biblical discipleship. Well, you need to be a disciple that grows. The idea of being in a chronic rut where you haven't grown in a long time, that's dangerous. All of us get in temporary ruts, right? And, and we got to jump out of that. But the long-term one, that, 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 should, that should have uh, some people terrified, right? Uh, we're supposed to be growing. And, and what does that mean? It means we become more like Jesus. We grow in Christ-likeness. 
Not self-righteousness, not like the Pharisee in Luke 18, I tithe, I do this, blah, 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 blah. He's comparing himself to the tax collector. That's self-righteousness. That's not biblical growth. Biblical growth is I abide in Jesus Christ, okay? And so I know as long as I remain in him and remain in his grace, I'm going to grow in his word through the spirit um, and, and, and through uh, the, the body of Christ, right? And so I need to be growing. I need to be reading books about the Bible. Most importantly, I need to be reading the Bible, you know, itself, okay? And so, um, and by going to church, you're going to grow from the ordinary means of grace, hearing the word preached, seeing baptism, partaking the Lord's Supper, all those things lead to biblical growth, to discipleship. And I would say that there needs to be a culture in the church where the stronger brothers and sisters take on those who don't know as much and pour into them. Uh, you know, pour into them biblical knowledge, biblical living, and then all of us do that, that, that we all take that responsibility. Well, if you're going to be a healthy church member, not only are you looking to grow, you're looking for somebody who could pour into you, but then you're also looking for somebody that you can help grow right? That's a healthy church member. When you act like the pastors are the ones who are supposed to be doing all the discipleship, no, we do group discipleship through the sermons, right? And then what's supposed to happen is it trickles down to the healthy church members who then are all discipling each other, okay? So, um, so yeah, a healthy church member is a disciple grower and a disciple maker, okay? And so you participate in the local church, take the ordinary means of grace, and if you really want to grow, live in light of the second coming. Jesus said when he returns, he wants to find us doing what we're supposed to be doing. If you're serving like he could come back anytime, you're serving like I got to finish what he's given me to do. And if that's how you're living, you're always going to be in a state of growth. Okay. Um, mark number nine is be a humble follower because the, the ninth mark was biblical leadership, which was plural eldership. So for a healthy member, mark number nine is going to be a humble follower. Okay, to, to follow the leaders that God has put over the church. Listen, this makes or breaks a church. 1,100 pastors quit every month. And a lot of times it's because of sinful members who just don't want to do what God says. Um, and, and so that makes it miserable for leaders that God gives as a gift to the church. Okay, um, so that being said, one way that's an important way for you to be a healthy church member is to be somebody that supports your leaders, especially when your leaders are faithful to the word. And if you're growing in your biblical theology and you listen expositionally anyway, you're going to be able to tell if you have a faithful pastor. Now, if you're not growing and you just have your own ideas of what a faithful pastor is, your ideas might not even be biblical. So you might be a thorn in their side for all the wrong reasons just because you're shooting from the hip from your own opinions or preferences. References. That's wrong, and the Bible rebukes you, okay? If you're growing in the Word, and you're growing in your theology, and you're saturated with the gospel, and then you have pastors that preach expositionally and want to see you grow, then yes, they're a gift from God to you. That is what Ephesians chapter 4 says. And so, so you be a gift to them. Pray for them. Um, you know, follow what they say as long as it's biblical. Imitate them as far as they imitate Christ. Encourage them. Financially support the work of the ministry so that they're able to, to not have to worry about whether or not they're feeding, they're going to be able to feed their family. And then they can just focus on, on the word. You know, 1 Timothy 5.17 says, uh, you know, the pastors that are dedicated to teaching are worth double honor, which not only is hold them in respect, but also it means pay them well. And, and then two verses later in 1 Timothy 5.19, it's telling you to protect their reputation. Don't even receive an accusation against them if there's not three witnesses. Okay, so when somebody comes to you to complain about the pastor and you're just listening Without you saying, wait a minute, I don't want to hear this unless you got three witnesses that there was wrongdoing. If that, then yeah, listen, because then that pastor needs to be confronted. But if it's just somebody typing over something dumb or something that's just their preference, don't even listen to them. Rebuke them. Go back to the church discipline thing. Correct them because it's corrective. I'm not even supposed to listen to this. You're putting bad thoughts in my mind about somebody that God gave to me and this church as a gift. And why? Just because your preference isn't being met? Sorry. You know, so, so you protect the reputation. You don't even give opportunity for somebody to talk trash about them unless there's those, those three witnesses. Okay. And so 
We're supposed to have an open-hearted love towards our leaders. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 11 through 13, Paul's pleading with the Corinthians, like, I have an open-hearted love for you. Can't you have an open-hearted love for me? And how sad that, that a preacher had to beg the people he, he loves so much and serves so much, he had to beg them to return that love. It shouldn't be that way. It's because... As we know, the Corinthians were not a healthy church. They didn't have healthy church members. There were other churches Paul wrote to that were healthy. He didn't have that problem. He was so overjoyed at them and the love that they give him. So be that way towards your pastors. Be a humble follower. And don't be greedy with your pastors. Sometimes uh, people will be like, no, I don't want to share my pastors. Um... You know, so you don't want them to go to conferences or maybe their denominations inviting them to be a speaker. No, we don't want you to go. You're going to be away for two weeks. We need you here. Well, hold on a second. Your pastor needs to grow as well. And so conferences help them with that. And not only that, it's good to be jealous for them in the sense that, okay, it means you love them and you appreciate the work that they do. But at the same time, listen, you can't be greedy. If God's calling them to serve on a bigger scale, but they still get to serve your church, that's an even bigger blessing, right? Because not only are they preaching to you and helping you, but then the Lord has seen fit to have them do it to an even broader audience, knowing that you're still their main focus, okay? So just keep that all in mind. Oh, and finally, uh, sorry, Hebrews thirteen seventeen says you're supposed to obey and submit to your leaders. If you don't, he more or less says they're going to be miserable trying to lead you, and that doesn't benefit you at all. Okay, so that's the. those are the nine marks that correlate to the nine marks of a healthy church. So please, you know, incorporate this into your life. Be somebody who expository listens and is uh, into your biblical theology, saturated with the gospel, who's genuinely converted, seeks to convert others genuinely with evangelism, that you're a committed member, okay, that attends regularly and gives regularly and serves regularly, that you're uh, you're being disciplined in both the, in all the good ways, right, and, and are helping to hold others accountable, that you're a growing disciple who's growing other disciples, and that you're a humble follower. The tenth mark that um, Anna Wheely adds that was not um, in Dever's book is just be a prayer warrior. And I'll just keep that one simple. Pray for all the things the Bible tells you to pray for. Uh, I recommend praying Psalms. That helps. But just pray for everything that the Bible tells you to. Pray for uh, the, the our politicians. Pray for your pastors. Pray that the Lord will send workers into the harvest. Pray that the, the, the gospel spread. Pray that... Uh, um, you know, pray that, uh, pray for your enemies, pray for all believers, pray for one another. Um, and just listen, God listens to our prayers and we are supposed to, to pray. So a lot of the stuff I was mentioning was about us hearing from God, letting God talk to us through his word and through the doctrines of his word. Prayer is where we now get to talk to God. And when you have a constant uh, back and forth where you're speaking to God and yet God's speaking to you through his word, you're going to grow. And you're going to be a healthy church member. And if you're a healthy church member, helping to build up other healthy church members, you're going to have a healthy church. And the stuff that the Lord is going to do through you and your church will be absolutely amazing. So let us all press on and be healthy churches that are filled with healthy church members. And so that concludes this book. Um, And so the next one, as I said, I'm going to be still going with healthy churches as a theme. So I'm going to be covering Juan Sanchez's Seven Dangers Facing Your Church. So not only do we have to be a healthy church with healthy members, but we also got to know where the dangers are that are trying to knock our churches off course. So in the next few lectures, I'll be going over this book. With that, thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time.